In our first ever episode of Morbid Musicians, made over a year ago now, we discussed the blues legend Robert Johnson, a musical icon who was so good at the guitar that there were rumors revolving around him that he actually sold his soul to the devil. Although Johnson is arguably one of the most famous musicians to have this rumor tied to their name, there is a musician who was born over a hundred years prior who not only had a similar rumor, but actually went down in history as one of the greatest violinists of all time. This man was Niccolò Paganini. He lived a very interesting but difficult life, and he was considered both a musical prodigy and a troubled man who could not escape his vices and demons. Well, those demons literally chased him to the grave because by the time he died, there was a cemented rumor that he made a pact with the devil in order to achieve the greatness that he did. Some thought this was a silly idea that shouldn't be taken too seriously, and some people believe this to be an actual fact. Either way, it is worth having a look at his life, his music, and the dark mythology that surrounded his artistry. This is the story of Niccolò Paganini. Paganini was born on the 27th of October, 1872, in Genoa, Italy. He was one of six children and he was not raised into a wealthy family. In order to make enough money to keep things afloat, his father would play the mandolin and at only five years of age, Niccolo would begin to do the same. Only two years later, at seven years of age, Niccolo transitioned to the violin and it was clear from the beginning that he was an exceptional talent who had a lot of natural ability. So much so that he ended up taking lessons from some local violinists. He ended up surpassing them pretty quickly. Because of this, his father took him to see a violinist named Alessandro Rola, who heard Niccolo play once and immediately decided that he was not good enough to teach him. He then referred him to his teacher, Ferdinando Pear, and after a while, Pear did the exact same thing, deciding that even he wasn't good enough to teach Niccolo and that he needed the guidance of his teacher, Gasparo Goretti. It's unclear how long Goretti actually taught Niccolo, with some reports saying that it was only a few months, and others saying that it was up to two years. But this time was well spent because even though Niccolo was barely a teenager, Goretti's influence could be heard for years throughout Niccolo's work. These lessons ultimately came to an end, and things were about to change very quickly because in 1796, the French army invaded northern Italy and his birthplace of Genoa was also attacked leaving Niccolo and his family in a strange wilderness where they took refuge in various different areas. They would eventually continue to travel around Italy, sharing Niccolo's talents and this culminated in him becoming the first violin of the Republic of Lucca at only 18 years of age. At this stage, he had also privately mastered the guitar and done so very quickly. He did not share these abilities. Instead, he would publicly play the violin and privately play the guitar, using it as almost a recreational activity to take a break from his more intense career as a violinist. With all this being kept in mind, it's very clear that Niccolo was a musical prodigy who could learn and even master stringed instruments very quickly. But even with his musical abilities, his new title, and the fact that his music was now his main form of income, none of this could stop Niccolo's own personal vices. At the age of 18, he was already suffering from alcoholism and various other addictions. He was known as a gambler, a drinker, and a womanizer, and it was clear that he was living a certain type of lifestyle that probably wasn't going to end too well. But even with these vices and Niccolo's insane talents, the rumors and the idea that he sold his soul or even had any affiliation with the devil was not out there in the public. Although he had impressed pretty much everybody he had come across, Niccolo wasn't known at all except for in certain parts of Italy. This would change, however, and soon he would be known all across Europe. But it is that success that would lead to the exact rumors that would be tied to his name forever. You may think that because Niccolo was so talented and respected at such a young age, that it wouldn't take long for his career to take off and for him to become a musical phenomenon. But that wasn't the case. In fact, from the years of 1801 to 1813, he basically remained a popular local musician who was barely known outside of northern Italy. He still played for some influential people. In fact, he was even a violinist for Napoleon's sister, Elisa Bacchiacci. But this wasn't really helping him make a name for himself outside of these areas. In fact, it was probably doing the exact opposite because this pigeonholed him into a restrictive area that he could not get out of. But this changed in 1813 when he performed a concert at La Scala Theatre in Milan. It's widely considered to be one of the most important performances ever showcased at La Scala because it introduced him to a much wider audience and this is considered to be the jumping off point for his future success. 
Although he continued to mostly play in Italy, certain things started to happen that would indicate that Niccolo was on his way to bigger and better things. One of these indications was actually the rivalries that he had with fellow violinists that saw him play in 1813. His name was now in the ether and certain musicians took issue with the idea that this man was better than them at what they did. One example of this was violinist Charles Philippe Lafont, who actually challenged Niccolo to a concert contest in 1816. This also took place at La Scala Theatre and although there wasn't technically a winner, many of the accounts that night state that Niccolo was the crowd favourite. These kinds of contests happened numerous times and Niccolo often reigned victorious. He was literally battling some of his contemporaries and he was consistently coming out on top and proving his worth. After the 1810s, he finally started to gain some traction across Europe, specifically in 1827 when Pope Leo XII gave him the Order of the Golden Spur, a form of knighthood in the Catholic Church that essentially made Niccolo a lot more powerful and influential than he already was. And this was the basis for kickstarting his first ever European tour where he went to every major city in Italy, Germany, Poland, and Bohemia. This tour showcased to a very wide audience the extent of Niccolo's ability. He would do things that at the time had never been done and literally changed the way the people played the violin in future years. Everything from his posture to the position of his hands were considered unconventional at the time, and for some performances, he would not use sheet music. Instead, he would simply play based on memory, which was also unheard of. This unconventional style would soon become the norm for many players, and it's safe to say that this tour, which lasted around three years, was one of the most important things to ever happen for classical music as it showcased Niccolo's ability to a wide audience and ultimately changed everything. It's quite ironic to think about now that this this tour is where the rumor that he sold his soul to the devil came from, because this tour arguably would not have happened if Niccolo wasn't given a title by the Pope himself. It's two sides of a very interesting coin, and it only adds more intrigue to his already insane life. By 1834, Niccolo was already known throughout Europe as one of the best violinists in the world, but he had an array of health problems that would ultimately end his concert career in September of that year. However, during his time as a live performer, Niccolo began to establish a certain image that was hard to ignore. For one, his actual appearance was brought up quite a lot. An article by Maggie Shaw Roberts described Niccolo as a striking man with hollow cheeks pale skin and thin lips. He was very tall and thin, and often dressed in black. He also had very long, thin fingers, and without the restriction of performing with sheet music, he flailed about on stage, earning him the nickname Rubberman. This description tells us that the people who attended Niccolo's concerts would often be greeted by an interesting looking man to say the least. It was an aesthetic that helped propel Niccolo's dark image and sometime during his concert career, a rumor started that the devil himself could occasionally be seen at these events. Combine this with his eccentric performances, his soulless image, and his almost otherworldly talents and you'll get a pretty clear idea as to why people were so convinced that Niccolo sold his soul to the devil. The man himself never really addressed this rumor, and that's probably because he had his own problems to deal with. As I mentioned previously, he had some serious health problems. He was diagnosed with syphilis in 1822, tuberculosis in 1834, and also had a number of other syndromes and conditions that stifled his health. Most of these things didn't actually kill him, but the culmination of problems would eventually catch up, and by the year 1840, Niccolo was living in Nice, France, which would be the last place he ever lived. While he was dying, the Bishop of Nice sent over a priest to read Niccolo his last rites. But Niccolo believed that this was premature and did not think he was going to die so soon. Unfortunately, this was not the case as a week later on the 27th of May, Niccolo died from internal hemorrhaging. He was not read his last rites and because of this and the associations that he had with the devil, he was not allowed to be buried in the local church. This also added to the mystique and made this rumor even more popular. Again, it's quite ironic that the church itself itself essentially fueled these rumors and even though it was probably unintentional, the damage was already done. From now on, Niccolo Paganini would forever be associated with the devil and every story and history book about this man would include that rumor. But nothing took away from his talents. Even if people wondered where he got them, he was still one of the greatest violinists to ever live and he changed the musical world forever. 
The idea of a musician selling their soul to achieve greatness is a double-edged sword. In a weird way, you could say a rumor like this is almost flattering. Robert Johnson was so good at the guitar that he must have sold his soul, and Paganini was so good at the violin that he must have done the same. These rumors may be something that are used to undermine these musicians and take away from all the hard work it took to become that great, but at the same time, they were that good. And the idea that people were so baffled by this that they had to create a story in order to justify their talent is a compliment in disguise. Some people just could not fathom this level of skill and it is a testament to their greatness. Niccolo Paganini was a complicated man with a life full of vices and health problems, but he achieved greatness beyond his wildest dreams and changed music forever. I recommend listening to his compositions. I think you'll enjoy them, even if you do think the devil is pulling the strings.